career by working with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assaults. In 2016, she obtained her clinical license while working at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She went on to chair the Abuse and Neglect Committee for three years, where she worked to address safety concerns for oncology patients. She works part-time as an adjunct professor at Sam Houston State University, teaching courses on family violence and child abuse. During her work providing counseling on end-of-life goals, Tatiana is interested in finding new therapeutic intervention interventions to assist her terminally ill patients with death anxiety. She continues to work at MD Ander Anderson in the thoracic surgery unit. When she isn't working with patients, Tatiana enjoys baking, going to art museums, and playing with her dog to live. Tatiana, thank you so much for joining us today. Go ahead and take it away. Oh, thank you so very much. Um, I am glad to be here with you all. Um, uh, one of the things I love about working at MD Anderson is that we don't just try to treat a person's um, diagnosis, but we also try to te uh, uh, treat a person holistically. Um, we want to make sure that a person's emotional well-being and their mental health needs are being addressed, along with learning who the person is, what, what they value, what's important to them, and also supporting their support network. Who's their caregivers? Do they need a little help? And um, also addressing barriers to care. Um, in this presentation, I'd just like to take some time to talk about the importance of addressing mental health concerns and how social work can be a support in that. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so um, this is, I Have No Mouth But I Need to Scream is actually a title of a horror novel um, that I read recently, but I thought it was really accurate in regards to how it can feel when someone's carrying around a lot of anxiety or symptoms of depression and they don't have anyone to chat with. We never want people to feel as though they have to keep everything on the inside where they can feel like they're suffocating and not having a chance to, to express how they really feel. Um, you know, something to sort of just keep in mind is that um, a lot of times with um, our, our emotions and our mental health, it's never um, stagnant. We never feel maybe the same way um, from moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day. Um, we can have really good days where we feel really great. We can have harder days where we just, um, it's harder to push through. And sometimes we can uh, feel good at the start and then feel bad and vice versa. Um, but we, what we wanna do is that if you find yourself struggling where it's harder and harder to get out of bed it's harder and harder to do your daily tasks it's harder and harder to have interactions with others or even just enjoying the things that you love most uh, we want to to let you know that social work can be someone that you can talk to that we're here for you um, um sometimes it can be as simple as just being able to identify how we're feeling sometimes we're not even sure how we're feeling because we're feeling so many things at the same time or we're feeling numb and we're not feeling anything at all. So everything is kind of blah and under like a gray curtain. Um, sometimes we're so used to carrying anxiety or symptoms of depression around, we might not even be aware of it. It's just, it started to become our normal. And then a lot of times when patients start to have a little bit of therapy or they get into a support group, um, they end up realizing, wow, I didn't realize how much I needed to process. And then they feel actually lighter and a little bit better because they've, they've made a true connection with somebody else. Um, also, um, um, sometimes patients may feel a little nervous uh, or confused about why they're feeling anxious or depressed even after treatment. It's not uncommon for patients to have, when they are first diagnosed, to have a huge spike um, in anxiety and depression, and then they work hard to adjust why they're going through treatment, or they're just concentrating on pushing through treatment so that when they actually go ahead and they um, finish and everything is um, settling down and they don't have to come to MD Anderson, except for maybe follow-ups or check-ins, that they may have another spike of anxiety and depression. It can be pretty intense. And that's actually very normal. Um, it's because sometimes when we push everything down to get through treatment, it's sort of like um, 
uh, like um and um like that closet where we fill everything up with stuff so the guests don't see and then um we open it up because now we can concentrate on our emotional well-being and then we get hit with all the stuff that's been pushed into that closet so um um I'm so sorry I think there's someone in the That's a very good point, um, Catherine. Um, Catherine said that um, one of the problems that they have with a cancer support group is that making connection with friends and then having their friends pass um, can be traumatizing and also for uh, feel discouraging. And and that is true. You're you, many people have shared that with me before. A lot of people with support groups are kind of split in half. Sometimes people have support groups where they that's that's how they get through they they need that support network they they thrive in it they they enjoy it it gives them a sense of being able to have that connection but there's also um, another half that they feel support groups are not helpful for them and that uh, they feel like it's re-traumatizing um, even if uh, no one in the support group passes uh, just even just hearing about other people's journeys can be um can be re-traumatizing for them. And, and that's what um, we want to work on when we provide counseling is figuring out what's important to you and what would help. Sometimes connecting with others means a cancer support group. Other times connecting with others could be connecting over a hobby or cooking a meal together with your loved ones. Um, and, and, and that's what we're looking for. We're not saying that we have the solution cut and dry, copy and paste for everyone because everyone is different. Um, also, um, something to be mindful of is a lot of times with mental health, um, we people can start to feel, they'll tell you that they feel fine. Everything is fine. Everything is great. But they don't know why they're tired all the time, or they just have a lack of energy, or they just don't really enjoy things like they once did. Sometimes symptoms of depression or um, difficulties coping can be really subtle. Uh, maybe, you know, you really enjoyed playing video games with your friends online and you were really um, into your campaigns, but you find yourself doing that less and less and less. Or maybe you used to bake all the time and you like to make cupcakes and you like to have cookies, but then you find yourself just not having the energy to do so. Um, you know, it, it could be a physical symptom. Of course, treatment can make us very tired, but we always want to just sort of check in to make you, make sure that there isn't some um, emotional component um, or, or depression or anxiety that might be um, playing a part. Um, not to say that we, we think that you have to be happy all the time either. Sometimes people feel that social work, we're going to tell you to put on a smile and have a happy face. And that's not the case. Sometimes it's very healthy and very appropriate to be sad and to be experiencing anxiety because it's based off the situation. Um, having a sarcoma diagnosis is is anxiety provoking it, it there is a lot of grief with it um um and i don't just mean grief like um a lot of times when people think grief and loss they might be thinking about like the death of a loved one or like the death of a pet but that's not the case sometimes grief comes along with the fact that you know i was preparing to go to college and now i i can't go to college because i have to have treatment here in houston I was preparing to like uh, travel. I was going to have this big um, travel plans with my friends, but now I, I, you know, I have to go ahead and do my treatment plan. So I'm not able to do that. Um, I used to have more energy where I would exercise, you know, three to four times a week. And now I'm just so tired. I need to sleep all the time. So the things that we have to um, lose during treatment you know, there's a lot of grief with that. And that doesn't mean it's depression. It just means that you're going through the grieving process. And that is something social work would like to, to help you go through because, because grief, grief is different than depression. It is. And I, I always think we should sort of acknowledge that. Um, um, sometimes adapting to our new normal can be really hard and we have a hard time adjusting. Um, not all the times, but sometimes with treatment, um, we may have changes in our bodies. Um, our weight may fluctuate. Sometimes surgeries, there may be 
um, um, how our body looks after surgeries that we may have to address, um, just, just any of it. Um, and we always want to keep that door open because it's not the same thing as saying a person has body image issues because they just don't like the way they look. It's, Hey, I've, I've gone through really harsh treatment and my body has changed. I'm kind of trying to adapt to that, how it feels, how it looks, how I feel about myself afterwards. And those were all really important questions. And we want to bring that up because that that's also part of the grieving process sometimes. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, there's, I just want to check the chat real quick. This is a, a, a very um, good point, Ashley. It, it is about being able to tease through and figure out if a person is depressed or if their medications are affecting them or is a side effect from chemotherapy or radiation. Um, um, sometimes what we have to do is just recognize it can be a combination of things or recognize um, um, spending time with them to getting to know them and see what's going on. Did they react this way with the chemotherapy before? Um, what else is going on in their life? Um, you know, how did they cope before? Who's in their support system? Did any other changes happen? Um, it's really getting to know our patients or the, the caregivers and family members, really getting to know who they are and then helping them identify. Their, what I love about my work is that I don't have to try to figure it out alone the patients or the caregivers will let me know, um, you know, they're, they usually, I might help provide a little guidance, but then they'll be able to quickly identify what's going on with them. Um, and uh, they're able to go ahead and um, share with me, absolutely, I, I am depressed, or you're right, I never realized it, I am grieving. I am grieving. I'm grieving all the changes and the losses that have happened to me over the course of this period of time. So I usually let them guide. And then I try to ask probing questions and give support and reflections to make sure I understand what they're saying so that the patient themselves can figure out what's going on with them. Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, also, sometimes, um, a lot of times people don't want to talk about it but it's actually very normal for patients to sometimes feel um, or have thoughts of um, suicidal ideation. Um, it doesn't mean that they wanna act on it. Um, it just means that they might have intrusive thoughts where they just, it flies into their head or they're feeling really overwhelmed and they're not sure how to cope. So our brains are really powerful problem seekers. I like to joke that Houston's a testimony to this only we would arrive into a swampy human area and invent air conditioning so people could live here, right? Well, our brains are very powerful when it comes to situations where we feel trapped. And sometimes one of the answers could be that suicide pops up in a person's brain. And that can be very scary for the patient and for their family members. Usually in my experience, a person is most likely actually not wanting to die by suicide but they're just feeling so overwhelmed and so trapped that their brain is looking for any way to get out of the situation. And oftentimes with counseling, support from social work, support with psychiatry, finding mental health resources in the community, connecting with their friends and family, that can really help um, calm those thoughts down and, and, and um, give them a redirection. Um, sometimes people, the way that they're built because of their personal history of trauma, they may even just cope with chronic suicidal ideation, but it's just something that they kind of live with and cope. It's just how their brain is wired and, the, and that's the thoughts that pop into their mind. But by being open and talking about it, um, the risk of, um, of a person um, um, dying by suicide gets reduced greatly because they're not alone. They don't have to carry that, that um, um, internal pain by themselves. Okay. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, added to this is um, another scary topic. It's just death within itself. Um, a lot of times people are, when they receive a cancer diagnosis, the thought of their own mortality comes up. 
And it's something that they are thinking about, but they may feel like there's no one to talk to about it. It takes a lot of courage to sort of talk about death and our mortality, especially when we get a diagnosis of cancer. But I find in my work, and um, my other colleagues have shared this as well, that when we're able to talk about it, it no longer has the same power over us. We don't have to ruminate on it. We don't have to carry that weight alone. We don't have to feel like um, it's a secret that nobody wants to hear about. Um, again, like the toxic positivity, we we want to get away from that. So being uh, positive is very powerful. I don't want to minimize that. Being positive can be very helpful and can really help people cope. But sometimes people need a place to process that fear. Um, it doesn't mean that there's it's going to come true. It doesn't mean that they're suicidal. It doesn't even mean that they're depressed. It just means that, you know, they're they're it's a real fear and and they need someone to sort of talk about it. And this can lead into really good discussions of knowing what's important to you, what matters to you, how can we make sure that we're respecting all of your wishes? What, what do you want your friends and family to know so they can best support you? Um, and it doesn't even have to go farther than the counseling sessions with social work or a private therapist or even with psychiatry. Sometimes people feel good just having that one session of just letting their thoughts and feelings out into the world and talking about it. And then it's like letting, you know, the kettle off the, um, off the hot burner. It's, it's no longer bubbling over. Um, um, we just really want to make sure that if this is something you're thinking about and you have um, existential questions, we want to be here for you. We're here for all the hard conversations. Um, and, and, you know, this can let us really dive down deep into knowing who you are and what you value, which can be helpful when developing your treatment plan. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about social work and how we can help. Um, there's about 80 of us here in the institution. Our job is um, we're all master level social workers. So we all went through grad school and, and at least got our master's. And then um, most of us either have or are working on our clinical license, which lets us, um, for example, my clinical license would let me be able to open up a private practice. So we're all clinicians, mental health clinicians, we're able to, to do support groups, individual counseling, um, you know, um, we're able to help um, find tools for our clients. The great news is, is that MD Anderson is, is that we're a built-in cost, so we're free. Um, we don't charge your insurance because you talk to us. We won't charge you if you talk to us. If your caregiver, your spouse, your parents, your friends, they they happen to be in the room with you and they need someone to talk to. We're, we're, go we're going to help. We're going to be there for support. And they don't have to worry about any um any surprise bills, which is which I I, I feel very lucky about that part. Um we work with your medical teams. Um the way we're divided up is that we go ahead and we'll have um um, um, each outpatient clinic will have a social worker or social workers attached to that clinic. Um, for example, I'm the geriatric um, social worker and I'm also half of plastics. Um, so I have a partner with plastics and reconstructive surgery. Um, everybody on an inpatient floor, every floor um, will have a social worker for that floor. Um, so whether you're admitted or you're outpatient, um, you will have a social worker. Usually your primary social worker is with your home center. So I'm going to let y'all um, know who your social workers are for sarcoma. But um, sometimes that changes in the treatment process. So if you go on to radiation, for example, you will um, switch from having your sarcoma social workers to your radiation social workers who will take care of you because they work with those teams and they understand the process really well. So, and then once you're done with radiation, you go back to the sarcoma social workers who work with your oncology teams, know them very well, and they can really be an advocate for you. Um, maybe you're feeling um, oh, um, overwhelmed with how are you going to come down to Houston? Where are you going to live? That's a barrier to care, right? 
um, we can help address those concerns. Um, let's look at the community resources. What do you qualify for? If there are no community resources, what can we, what could work within your life to try to make it feasible? Um, is transportation a concern? Maybe you were working and your insurance was through your job, but then, um, you know, sometimes with treatment, we have to stop working, which can affect our health insurance. And so we can sort of see what might be available for you if that's ever, a, if that ever, and I hope it doesn't, but if that ever becomes a worry. Um, we like to help people with building a community. Um, support groups are not for everyone. This is true, um, but for a lot of people, um, we like to try to connect them. For example, the um, uh, adolescent and young adult clinic, um, that might be a really good fit for a lot of people. Um, you, They do like little parties and um, like activities so people can connect and meet. And if you develop a friendship, you might be able to text. I've heard so many stories that um, a patient will end up in the ACCC and then they'll text the AYA group and somebody will come and sit with them while they're waiting in the emergency center or like they share funny little memes or, you know, they just sort of check in with each other. It doesn't have to be that you go to like a scheduled group, but just sort of building those friendships. Um, there's my cancer connection, which can be really helpful. Um, there, um, that's where they um, partner you with somebody who's gone through the same treatment that you were going through. Um, we could help you maybe find, if you don't want to do something that's related to MD Anderson or cancer, maybe we can help you connect with like a private practice therapist in your community. Um, sometimes with social work, because you may have a different social work worker respond to you just depending on your treatment plan. Um, some people prefer to have a counselor outside of MD Anderson that they can see weekly, Tuesdays at three o'clock, I am going to see my therapist but you may not know how to navigate that. And that's where social work can come into play. Um, we can help uh, um, help you reach out to psychiatry if you need help. Um, 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 and mostly maybe you don't really need us long. Maybe you just need us to be someone who can just listen to you. We don't have to solve anything. We don't have to um, have, um, we don't have to go down the war path and, and, and like try to shake things up or talk to anybody else for you. Sometimes people are happy just to have a confidential space where they can just say what they're really feeling and not worry about it, um, affecting, um, any, any relationships outside of, of their relationships with their social worker. Cause sometimes we just are having a bad day and we need to vent. Um, sometimes patients are like, I hate Houston traffic. I dislike your all's coffee. I, I don't like the parking situation down here and they just need someone to talk to. And, and that's where we can be a really good um, support system. We also help out with um, safety concerns. Um, I, I wish this wasn't the case, but sometimes our patients come here and they might be coping with a domestic violence situation or intimate partner violence situation. Um, abuse and neglect can be a worry, um, you know, um, like financial exploitation. Um, if any of those are a concern, please contact your social worker. We will work with you on safety planning and just trying to make sure that we respect whatever decision you have, but we get you in touch with the right um, safety resources and community resources. Um, um, also, we also help out with um, advanced directives. Um, advanced directives, you might have heard this term. I don't know how many of y'all have been um, asked this multiple times over. Um, we, we, we do like to check about this, but advanced directives and advanced care planning is really wonderful. Um, um, what happens in that is that we like to say if like if I'm on I-45 and I'm in a car accident and I'm knocked out cold, everybody needs me to consent to medical treatment, but I can't consent to medical treatment because I'm unconscious. So the medical power of attorney is somebody who can go ahead and um, make decisions on my behalf. Is that going to be your spouse? Is that going to be your parents? Is that going to be um, like a cousin who you really trust? Maybe your cousin is a doctor. Um, we would like to know who that person is so we can put them down. You can also have backups to them in case we couldn't reach that person. And we can help you do those forms for free. 
We can also um, complete other uh, medical directives, such as like um, a living will, which has to do when a person's terminal, but they're on life support. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and also other medical directives as well. If you have any questions about that, and if you ask, you don't have to fill it out right away. We can talk about it, go further into depth. Um, but we really want to do that for you, um, just so that there's no stresses in case there is an emergency. Um, counseling and coping. Um, I've talked a lot about this, but we always want to sort of figure out what's been helping you and what's been making you cope. Um, sometimes you have a lot of things that do help you cope and we just have to just gently remind you, oh, uh, of it. Um, and I, I realize I'm coming up to time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go a little faster, but basically we can help you do mindfulness activities, grounding exercises for anxiety that you don't need to buy anything. You can just learn how to do these techniques in your head. I love the five, four, three, two, one, where it's like, I name, if I'm really anxious, I name five things I can see, four things I can hear, three things I can taste, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason for that is so it brings me back to the present. So I'm not catastrophizing about the future and I'm not ruminating on the past. I'm just in the zone of what's going on now and I can feel more relaxed. Um, therapy can help you unwind your thoughts and feelings and see how they're interconnected. And then like um, different therapies can help you refocus your thoughts and reframe your thoughts so you feel like you have a lot more control in your life and you're not just, um, you know, going through life with um, everything happening to you and you have no sense of control. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, what matters most is very important. This goes with the advanced care planning and sometimes getting to know you when you first show up for treatment. But where, where, what, what is quality of life to you? What, what are you hoping for? Where do you draw the line of what's okay and what's not okay? Um, for some people, um, because of their religious beliefs, they may not want to have any blood transfusions. Um, which is important for us to know. So we don't accidentally go against their spiritual beliefs. Um, sometimes for some people, they, um, they're they like, doesn't matter what's going on, give me all the treatment all the way forward completely. Other people, you know, they're like, it's really important for me to be able to enjoy food. How can we make sure that if I'm going through treatment, that can still be something that's taken into consideration, or if that's going to be affected, what can I do to sort of cope with that? Um, again, I love people who, who keep on a positive smile and a positive um, outlook. That is really important. I never want to take that away, but we always want to make sure that we give you space to sort of be sad so we can see what would help you during that so we can make sure it's a genuine positivity that you're going through and what connects you to your family and friends is it a scary movie night since we're in the halloween season or is it you know um going out for coffee with friends um how how can we keep that um in our mindset for you um next slide please here's some coping um, ideas and of course these are just general ones, you can definitely um, do, um, come up with more, um, being with nature, taking mindfulness walks um, in nature, um, a, you know, um, doing a garden, sometimes the AYA does a succulent garden, art activities, um, you can color mandalas outside in or inside out. Uh, mandalas are, uh, for those who don't know, are beautiful, intricate circles that sort of give your brain like a vacation. You're concentrating just enough on the drawing so you're not thinking, but the drawing is really easy so you're not feeling worn out. And that can be like a peaceful break for your brain. Journaling is a good way to organize your thoughts. Music can be so profoundly um, transformative. Um, I find that having um, um, music can really alter my mood make me from depressed to being able to have a cathartic release where I just cry and, and also lift me up and make me feel silly. Also being funny and having silly and laughing and not being serious is so beneficial. If that means like doing things you loved as a kid, laughing at jokes, sharing silly memes, watching funny movies, listening to stand up comedy, playing video games, um, doing a puzzle, Whatever it is that you can connect with others or just relieve stress and enjoy life, we strongly encourage. Um, next slide, please. 
um, how to find support. Um, let's say you want to connect with your social worker, but you don't know how. You can ask your nurse or your medical teams for a social work referral. You can send social work a my chart message, or you can call us. Um, you can um, uh, when you can fill up the PNS um, sheets, the patient's need screenings. You can ask to speak to a social worker and and let us know why. Um, we can also help you connect to other resources like I talked about before, like using psychology today to find a therapist or psychiatrist in your community. Maybe maybe your depression is, is getting really hard to cope with and you may need some medications to help with that. MD Anderson has a wonderful psychiatry department. We can ask your medical team to put in a referral. For those that it would be beneficial, support groups, absolutely support groups. Um, there's the Lifetime Buddy program as well. And also support for caregivers. There's caregiver support groups. Um, and, you know, there's um, um, articles and books and um, using the social, um, using the MD Anderson patient libraries for educational purposes and to learn what resources are available. And social work, we're here to help you do that. We, we want to help you with all of that. Um, next slide, please. So these are your social workers and they're wonderful. I have worked with all of them for many years. Um, Lori Capitat has been in sarcoma for, ooh, I, I would think six years or so. Um, she is excellent. She knows um, um, she knows this clinic inside and out. Um, she is fabulous. Um, she is a strong advocate to help you navigate barriers to treatment and also just to be an emotional support for you. Uh, Victoria Nichols, uh, Nicholas, um, she is just, I can't say enough about her. She actually won the Heart of MD Anderson Award um, a few years back, and it was very well deserved. She did the inpatient sarcoma, so she knows sarcoma inside and out as well. And now she's just now transitioned to um, outpatient sarcoma. And I can't say enough about uh, Lori and Victoria. Um, you guys have probably the best social workers. Um, and included in that is Cindy Parker and Jessica Blanc for the AYA social workers. For anybody who is 39 and under, who's not a pediatric patient, you guys um, have the AYA clinic. They are great. They do music therapy, help you with employment, schooling. They like to put on fun activities, to figure out what's important to you. They really take time and get to know you. Um, these four social workers are powerhouses and um, their numbers are below them right here. Um, and I, I strongly encourage you guys get to learn and and, and connect with them because um, they are, are, are true um, advocates and mental health clinicians in every sense of the word. Um, I do wanna be mindful of time, so I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, uh, please feel free to ask me any questions you have. Oh, um, thank you uh, all so much for your kind words. I really appreciate that. Is there anything I didn't go over that you guys had questions about that I, I could go over? Um, uh, not necessarily. If you are um, a caregiver to a patient, you can connect with social work. I'm sorry, um, Meredith had a great question that said, do you need to be an MD Anderson patient to connect with these social workers? Um, you don't. Um, if you're a caregiver, I recommend you connect with the social worker for your loved one. Um, so um, you can ask them for like caregiver resources and support like that. If um, um, sometimes that might change because again, like if radiation or something happens, a new social worker might, um, enter the chat. Um, but, um, um, I, I work with a wonderful crew. Um, there's no one I dislike that I work with. Oh, okay. Um, ah. Uh. This is a very, uh, these are really good points. Um, uh, Janae, and I, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, it, it can be hard to feel heard 
um, when loved ones, they mean well, but they just focus on what's working and they, they refuse, they kind of have like blinders on and they're like, nope, we're not going to see anything negative, hear anything negative, talk about anything negative. Um, I know a lot of people have a fear that that could uh, manifest um, things coming into play, which is, which is not the case. Um, but if you feel like being in a support group might give you um, like anxiety or misinformation, we certainly don't want that either. You could talk one-on-one -on -one with your social worker who works with your team. And we don't, we don't want you to carry it in. We want you to be able to scream going back to the horror novel. Yeah. We want you to use your voice. We want you to, to share, and you can ask for a private session. You can say, Hey, Lori, Hey, Victoria, if you have time, I would like to schedule a chance to talk with you because this is what's going on. And I really need just to be sad right now. I need to be, I need to say my fears and I need to be scared. And that's healthy. That's very healthy. Um, okay. Um, oh, excellent question, Ashley. Um, um, so Ashley is asking, um, as a family, they struggle to know what to ask the oncologist in front of the patient in terms of prognosis and life expectancy. That can be, um, that is a very sensitive, sensitive um, situation. It can be hard. I think it would depend on how old the patient is and, and um, if they're an adult, I think it's okay to maybe talk to them to see if they want you to ask those questions or if they want to ask their teams those questions um, because maybe they want to steer the ship in that. Um, a lot of um, young adults um, or um, teenagers, they they might feel like um, if they're not included in the, the conversation, that is kind of like a lie of omission. But at the same time, I know it can be anxiety provoking, um, trying to do that maybe on the spot. So maybe sort of see the comfort level because I know other young adults and um, teenagers who prefer um, mom or dad or their spouses to go ahead and, and to take the lead and they, and they don't want to have that. And it's a matter of figuring out those boundaries. Sometimes family therapy can help with that. Um, sometimes getting to know the, the patient's wishes in regards to um, who, who's going to be the filter for information and asking the questions can be really helpful. Um, I, I don't know what would work best for your family, but maybe if you reach out to social work, it could be something that you guys can navigate together um, as a family and then sort of see what would, what would work best. Um, are there any other questions I may be able to help with? All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, so I will go ahead and just thank you so much, Tatiana, for your inspirational and extremely educational presentation. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Oh, um, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed the opportunity. All 